Chapter 16, The Origin and Evolution of Microbial Life. So chapter 16 begins a whole entirely different unit in the book that will actually lead you into Biology 124 or the second half of biology. And so we're just going to mention the high points of evolution as well as some information on plants and animals, which is what you'll spend most of your time talking about in Biology 2. So this is a lead-in to your Biology 2, okay? So beginning with um, basic evolutionary principles. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to present uh, the theory of evolution to you in, um, in its main points, okay? And of course there's a lot of controversy as well on evolution versus creation and, and many other different trains of thought. So I'm just going to give you your textbook's viewpoint on the Big Bang Theory or evolution as the beginning of life, okay? So biological and geologic, geologic meaning, meaning sediments and rock, um, earth science, which you probably remember way back from when you were a little kid, biological and geologic history are very closely intertwined. and these fossilized mats of prokaryotes, remember prokaryotes are bacteria, fossilized mats of prokaryotes um, were found 2.5 billion years ago. And scientists believe they mark a time when photosynthesis was going on, um, was being done by bacteria, and bacteria began producing oxygen that made the atmosphere aerobic. Now remember what the word aerobic means, it means with oxygen. And so scientists believe that about two and a half billion years ago, bacteria began carrying out photosynthesis like the plants do that we talked about in chapter 7, and this began the production of oxygen that made the atmosphere oxygenated so that we were able to survive later on. These fossilized mats of bacteria, we can see a picture of this right here, are called stromatolites. Scientists believe that planet Earth was formed some 4.6 billion years ago. And they believe that the early atmosphere before life, so this is before life, probably contained water, carbon monoxide, that's what CO means, carbon monoxide, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and possibly some methane, that's what CH4 is, but very little or no oxygen. The environment also contained lots of volcanic activity, lightning, and ultraviolet radiation. So this is a picture of what scientists think the early atmosphere might have looked like. So it's very, very treacherous, very toxic, not, not a very good environment for living things because we know we can't breathe in carbon monoxide and we also don't want to breathe in lots of methane. Um, and so all of these things along with volcanoes, lightning, and ultraviolet radiation were very, very negative for the possibility of life. But scientists believe that the combination of all of those gases along with volcanic activity lightning and ultraviolet radiation might have mixed together and create what we know of now as life. Fossilized prokaryotes or bacteria date back as far as 3.5 billion years ago. And here's some more pictures of those fossilized bacteria or what we call stromatolites. Life may have developed from non-living materials as early as 3.9 billion years ago. And what scientists think is that small organic molecules appeared first. So things like monosaccharides, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids appeared first. And then they possibly grouped together to begin forming cells. This probably happened, scientists think, when chemicals were energized by lightning or ultraviolet radiation. Scientists believe this um, because of this man here who is known as Stanley Miller. 
And Stanley Miller was a, was a scientist who came up with an experiment that he believes shows that life could have arisen from all of these chemicals mixed with volcanic activity, ultraviolet radiation, and volcanoes. Um, volcanoes, ultraviolet radiation, and lightning. So this shows Stanley Miller's experiment. And this is actually an experiment that they have many um, first year biology majors do um, in, in the undergrad biology degree. But what they have you do is you set up Stanley Miller's experiment. And this is what Stanley Miller's experiment was. So we have a vial here filled with water and that water is heated until it forms steam or vapor. And that water vapor begins to escape up the tube and enters this little area here that contains methane and nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Okay, so this is supposed to simulate what the atmosphere was like way back um, when the Big Bang Theory was um, proposed to have happened. So here we have a simulation of that environment with methane, hydrogen, and nitrogen, um, and we've also got some electricity being shot in there that's supposed to kind of emulate uh, lightning. And the lightning being mixed with those gases, um, the water will then condense down through that, okay, and then is collected into a little flask there, okay, and then once we check uh, that sample for chemical analysis, there was found in it amino acids, sugars, and nucleotide bases, okay? Um, things like adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine from DNA, and also uracil from, from RNA were found to be collected in this vial. So the idea was if Stanley Miller could recreate that environment and then collect these subunits of life that this might be an indication that this could have happened to begin the earth and life. These molecules, these, these organic molecules such as sugar, lipids, and proteins um, subunits could have polymerized, which means grouped together on hot rocks or clay. And this could have produced polypeptides and short nucleic acids. The first genes may have been RNA, and these molecules could have catalyzed their own replication. So they, they could have been replicating, which could have then been incorporated into a cell, and we would have our very first cells. These molecules might have acted as rough templates for the formation of polypeptides. Polypeptides, remember, being protein. Prokaryotes, which are bacteria are, or cells without a nucleus, are the oldest life forms and they remain the most numerous and widespread organisms on earth today. If they were to decide to group together and take out all of us, they could easily do that because they outnumber us um, by a ridiculous amount. Um, we can see here in this picture, this is actually the microscopic view of the, the tip of a pin. Okay, and I, when I say pen, I don't mean a writing pen, but a, a, a pen you might use to pin clothing um, that's used during so, the process of sewing. And we can see on the tip of this pen, all these little yellow things, those are all bacteria that are on the tip of this pen. So it gives us an idea how tiny they are, but also how many they are. Um, this is also a very vivid uh this is a very vivid view at why it is so critical in healthcare that needles are sterilized. Um, think about if a needle wasn't sterile when you introduced it into the skin, you'd be pushing all this bacteria into the skin, potentially into the bloodstream, which could certainly cause big problems. Prokaryotes, remember, these are cells that don't have a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. Remember that prokaryotic cells have a cell wall, a cell membrane, cytoplasm, and DNA, but there's no nucleus and no other organelles. Prokaryotes were classified into two domains, 
based on their nucleotide sequences and other features. Um, there are two domains of bacteria. We talked about this way back at the beginning of the class. Bacteria and archaea. Remember bacteria um, are just our standard run-of-the-mill bacteria and then we have archaea which survive in um, very extreme situations like high ultraviolet light, um, high levels of acid or base, and extreme temperatures. Bacteria can also be grouped by their shape. Um, the first type of shape we have are circular spheres. These are called cocky, and these are the most common. Some of the bacteria you probably are familiar with, like strep or staph, um, Strep bacteria is the, the actual, if we write out the whole word for strep, it's streptococcus, which tells us that the strep bacteria is circular in shape, or staphylococcus when we talk about staph. And so bacteria that are circular are called cocky. Bacteria that are shaped like rods or little capsules, kind of remind me of little pills, capsules or rods, those are called bacilli, okay, bacilli for rod. And then we have some bacteria that are curved shaped, they're kind of spiral. This plate, this is a plate called, um, this is a culture plate, a petri dish full of something that we call auger. Um, auger is a seaweed based uh, material that contains um, glucose or sugar and bacteria love to feed on it. So um, in classes like microbiology, we use these plates and we can swab the plates with a Q-tip that maybe we've rubbed on a door handle or a Coke machine just to see how dirty they are. And we can swab these plates and let them sit for a while in an incubator. And the next day we have all these bacteria um, shows us what's growing on certain surfaces. And everywhere you see this cloudiness, that's bacteria. Now think about how many bacteria must be there in order for you to be able to see them without a microscope. That is an, a ridiculous amount of bacteria. Archaea, remember, live in places like anaerobic swamps. Anaerobic means without oxygen. They can live in salt lakes, hot springs, deep sea hydrothermal vents where the temperatures are uh, insanely hot, thousands of degrees, and in animal digestive systems where there are no, um, where there's no oxygen. Bacteria also have substances that can help them to stick to surfaces, and we have talked about this before as well. These little hair-like projections that surround the bacteria are called pili, and those pili are sticky little hairs that help bacteria stick to surfaces, whether it's your skin, the inside of your digestive tract, or even to a floor or a wall or a door handle. Some bacteria are pathogenic and they can cause disease. Um, we have two main types we're going to give as an example here. Um, the first is some bacteria produce what we call exotoxins, and exotoxins are toxins that are secreted by the bacteria. They're secreted out of the bacteria. Um, so exo meaning exit or out of, so they're secreted out of the bacteria. An example of, an, of a bacteria that produces an exotoxin that can make us sick is staph. Um, Staphylococcus aureus is the scientific name, but staph is a, an infection that we often hear about that runs rampant in hospitals. It's very easily spread from patient to patient, um, and staph can, can certainly cause nasty infections on the skin and can be very hard to get rid of if, it is, um, if it's a very resistant type of staph and, and we can't treat it easily. Um, <clears throat> Then we have also an endotoxin. An endotoxin is a toxin that is um, embedded within the cell wall of the bacteria. It's embedded within the cell wall. So if we ingest the bacteria, then we could certainly um, become very sick as well. And an example of that would be salmonella, which we know is a bacteria that is commonly found um, in poultry, in, in poultry meat. Um, we can also get it from handling reptiles. 
um, turtles, snakes, lizards, things like that, they carry salmonella as well. Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria that's carried by ticks. And you've probably heard of Lyme disease before. This is something that's carried by a tick, and a tick bites you, and this is the first thing that you'll, that you'll get. Um, we can see this large um, bullseye-shaped pattern on the, on the skin, and that bullseye pattern is characteristic of Lyme disease. A bullseye kind of forms right around where the bite happened. In 1876, Robert Koch discovered rod-shaped bacteria in the blood of cattle suffering from anthrax. Um, and this gives us an example how bacteria can be used for biological warfare. Um, certainly knowing that um, anthrax can, we know that anthrax was, was attempted to be used as a biological agent and probably still is being attempted attempted to be used in biological warfare. Um, when in the early 2000s um, we had people being mailed packets of white powder that turned out to be anthrax, and anthrax is extremely deadly um, <clears throat> and is an easy thing to spread, um, potentially put in the water supply or aerosolize um, over a large city. Um, things that many terrorists try to work with because it's an easy, quick, and sometimes inexpensive way to harm large populations. Very scary. The species that causes anthrax can be used as a biological weapon in war or acts of terrorism, which we were just touching on. But bacteria, as nasty as they can be, they can also be very helpful. There are some um, that are environmentally important in Earth's chemical cycles. Um, for example, we exploit decomposers in sewage treatment, um, meaning that a, a large part of our septic system works by bacteria. Um, bacteria is introduced into the septic tank and the bacteria actually feeds on the waste and helps break it down so that our septic system doesn't back up. And so bacteria are intentionally used in this way to try to help keep sewage treatment going because um, they're a great, great feeders on sewage. Bacteria can also help solve environmental problems like oil spills and toxic mine waste. Um, in this picture here, we can see uh, men that are spraying bacteria onto oil that has been um, has washed up on shore from an oil spill and these bacteria will actually feed on the oil to help break down the oil and get rid of it in a natural way. These proteists are multicellular um, photosynthetic organisms that lack the structural specializations of plants. Um, some examples are brown, red, and green algae. And this is actually um, getting, getting ready to introduce us into the plant chapter, which is chapter 17, when we talk a little bit more about plants. Um, so again, example of a protist, which is kind of similar to to a plant um, because they, they go, go through photosynthesis but they don't have the structural uh, specialization of plants and examples include again brown algae, red algae, and green algae and this is going to end chapter 16 but before we go into 17 just to give a little intro for you chapter 17 we're going to be talking about plants and some of the main structures of a flower and the different types of plants, which again, is just a little preview into what Biology 124 is going to be like. So this concludes chapter 16.